I uh, starting. Well, it just went quiet. What, uh, it, can't you say roll tape? Welcome to Becoming Canadian, Actually Doing It. My name is Stephen Shanebart. I'm a clinical psychologist and the author of I Actually Did It, Becoming Canadian Because of Trump. In this podcast, I chat with authors, experts, and friends about my experience immigrating to Canada, and I share my candid thoughts about U.S. and Canadian politics. I'll also tap into my psychological expertise to understand and to comment on political forces in our society. Today's podcast is going to be about the psychology of Trump supporters and what motivates Trump supporters. And for those of us who don't understand how people could be so fervently supportive of Trump and Trumpism and populism, psychology and psychological research has a lot to say about it. And Unfortunately, I think a lot of people who are not Trump supporters tend to think, well, they're just idiots or morons, and that's not particularly helpful or even accurate, Uh, and it's important to look at what motivates these people, Uh, and I'm going to talk about why. But the first thing I want to talk about, and this was not planned, this is a very recent development only in the last couple of days, but it's important, it's kind of breaking news, so I wanted to discuss it first and foremost is not about the particular topic, but is about a very big development in Canadian immigration. And all people who are interested in immigrating to Canada should know about it, because nothing like this in the over three years I've been involved in learning about Canadian immigration has come nothing close to this. What's happened is Canada has greatly, greatly eased, made it much easier for people to emigrate to Canada. I'll be more specific here. But basically what happened is because of COVID, they fell behind in the number of uh, applications for immigrating Canada they were processing. It went from their target was to have 341,000 people emigrating to Canada last year. And actually they ended up with 184,000. So they fell well short so to make up for it, they greatly reduced the, uh, the, the numbers that you need in the express entry program, which is one of the major ways to immigrate to Canada. That's the one that I got into Canada from. I am a successful candidate of the express entry program, it's called. Uh, and I'm going to uh, read a little bit here, but I have to put on my reading glasses. So I'm going to put them on. I like the color. I don't know what you think, but uh, my producer said it would be better if I didn't wear my reading glasses, but I have to to see. But um, he said there might be rings that you could see in the lens, but I don't think there. I don't think you can see the ring, right? It's not noticeable there, right? So, okay. So anyway, but I have to read. Um, Okay. So immigration dropped to its lowest level since 1998 in Canada because of COVID and the lack of processing applications. And uh, usually the cutoff for express entry, you need over 400 points. And they look for things like, uh, and it's all in my book, you need to take an English test. They, take a, they test your English and or, and or French speaking ability, level of education, your age, the younger you are, the better. Over 40, you get no points. Uh, things like that are looked at, among other criteria, whether you've worked in Canada or not. In my case, because I was over 40, I had to work for a year in Canada to accumulate enough points to clear over this 400 uh, number you have to get. You get points for each thing. What did they cut, drop it to uh, a recent weekend? Over 400 to 75. Okay. I mean, that's crazy. Now, here's the hitch. What they did is they said this only applies for immigrants who are applying with an ITA, invitation to apply. That's the term, ITA. They granted this ITA, but only to people who were already living in Canada who were applying for permanent residence status. So you had to be living there already. So that's not going to uh, apply to most people. But they, an immigration lawyer in the article said, um, 
this is what he had to say. Instantly, their whole pool of candidates is going to be gutted because they're basically letting everyone in, more or less, uh, who's already in Canada. They're just dropping the requirements uh, greatly. But then he said, this immigration lawyer said, they're going to have to look at people that are outside of Canada now, I believe, in order to meet these targets. So their first step was to gather everybody up who's living in Canada, but that's going to be depleted. And he believes, and it makes sense, soon they're going to be easing the requirements for people who live outside of Canada. How long this will last, um, uh, you know, is up in the air. But now's the time because they're trying to make up for their COVID shortage. Now's the time to, to think about applying to Canada. It won't always be like this. It will become competitive again. Um, so I wanted to bring that up because that's breaking news for all people. If you're thinking about it, move now on this. Get going on it now. I don't, there's no guarantee about you get the timing right, but nothing like this has ever happened uh, in my time knowing about it. Okay. And, and uh, as I'm going to talk about it, I talked about my first podcast and other podcasts, populism and Trumpism, in my firm belief, is not going anywhere. I don't think the U.S. is suddenly going to become this stable paradise. So if you're considering the Canadian option, Now's the time. I want to get into the psychology of Trumpism. Now, I'm a clinical psychologist. I have a PhD. In addition to my doctorate, I have four years of postdoctoral training at the William Allenson White Institute in Manhattan, which is a uh, institute where you study psychoanalysis and psychology. Uh, and <clears throat> so I have a lot of training. I have over 20 years experience in the field. And I've read about the research of Trump supporters. So there's a lot uh, there's a lot of research there. There's a lot of things to say to give people more understanding if you want to understand it and not just become huffy and say they're, they're idiots and they're morons and all that, which is, as I said, not helpful, not accurate. And also, I think if you want to learn how to reduce Trumpism populism, you need to understand it. You can't just write it off. That may feel good for a minute, but it won't get you anywhere. Okay, so I was thinking about the importance of this topic because a couple of weeks ago we had the impeachment, uh, which, of course, the, most of the Republicans voted to uh, defend Trump and keep him from being impeached. And a lot of people are very angry at the Republican congressman for that. Okay, and I understand that. But in a way, they're not the ones who primarily should be the target of people's ire. Um, they would not vote to protect Trump if the voters were not behind them. So what's going on with them? What's going on with the American population, at least almost half of them, that they adore this guy and nothing can shake their devotion to him? Well, psychology has some answers. I'm going to start with a uh, summary of uh, parts of an article by Dr. Bobby Azarian. Number one, psychological quality of Trump supporters that makes them different psychologically than non-Trump supporters is something called the authoritarian personality. Um, authoritarianism here refers to the advocacy of enforcement of strict obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom. It's commonly associated with a lack of concern for the opinions or needs of others. Authoritarian personality is characterized by the belief in total obedience to authority. So people with high and authoritarian personality will display aggression towards people considered in the out group. They also emphasize submissiveness to authority, resistance to new experiences, and rigid a rigid hierarchical view of society. It's often authoritarianism is often triggered by fear, which we'll get back to in a minute. And it makes this fear makes it easy for leaders to exaggerate threats and engage in fear mongering to gain the allegiance of these people. Um, so I do want to say, and so they, they tend to gravitate towards someone who's like a strong leader who can keep them safe from what they're afraid of, someone like Trump. Or if you think about, I won't name names, let's think about history. Um, I do want to say that it makes it sound like you're just a terrible person if you lean towards authoritarianism. I don't think it's that simple. If you think about things, and sometimes I do from an evolutionary perspective, if we had no authority, uh, no, nobody following authority, society would descend into chaos. So I think it's always a balance between having proper regard for authority and structure 
and of course, individual freedom and creativity and tolerance. But it isn't as if simple as the way that kind of this sounds, authoritarianism is terrible. It's a matter of proportion. And the second thing, a second psychological quality of Trump supporters has to do with something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is that human beings often overestimate their expertise on things. They think they know more than they do. And the heart of the, the Dunning-Kruger effect is that they think they know more than they do. And they really, if because they don't know so much about something, here's the key point. They don't know what they don't know. So they think they know everything because they don't even have the knowledge to know they don't know certain things. So they think they are experts on something when actually they're very ignorant about it. And uh, this is very dangerous because if people think they know it all, they think they're the ones who should be listened to when they don't know anything. They're also willing to follow someone like Trump who's frequently wrong, either because he's lying or he's uh, uneducated and ignorant, but they'll just assume he's right. And they'll assume that the people who are right, like experts, don't know what they're talking about. And they won't even know that they don't know. So that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I want to point out that the both Dunning and Kruger are associated with Cornell University, which is my alma mater, which is the most beautiful campus in the United States and probably the world and a great school. And I'm very devoted to it. And both of them are from there. One got his PhD there. The other one, Dunning, is a professor there. And more importantly, I have a good friend from high school, Larry Glickman, Lawrence Glickman now, who is a professor of history at Cornell University. And you can see his picture uh, today. There he is with his Cornell bio. And um, by the way, for those of you who saw pot, the first podcast, I spoke about the resemblance of my producer to my high school friend, Michael Levy, and how this really screws me up because I can't focus and can't concentrate because I think I'm talking to Michael Levy and it just it weirds me out. So um, Larry Glickman knows Michael Levy, who looks like my producer, Chris Russo. This is very important. It has nothing to do with the psychology of Trump supporters. It's very important to me. And so I'm talking about it. So as far as the Dunning-Kruger effect, it explains that the problem isn't just that they're misinformed, it's that they are completely unaware that they are misinformed, which creates a double burden. So you get people who follow fervently a man like this, who uh, thinks that the in the American Revolutionary War in the 1700s, the American army seized the British airports from the British. The Continental Army suffered a bitter winter of Valley Forge, found glory across the waters of the Delaware, and seized victory from Cornwallis of Yorktown. Our army manned the airport. It ran the ramparts. It took over the airports. It did everything it had to do. Unknown to everyone else in history were flying planes which were invented in the 20th century in the 1700s. Number three aspect of psychology, the psychology of Trump supporters is called the fear factor. Conservatives are more sensitive to threats. Uh, science has shown that the conservative brain has a, that they call an exaggerated fear response when faced with stimuli that may be perceived as threatening. So you've got one study in the journal Science that showed that conservatives have a stronger physiological reaction to startling noises and graphic images. Another one with brain imaging. And for those of you uh, watching the YouTube uh, video, you could see here how the brains of conservatives light up differently during scans than uh, the brains of uh, liberals uh, when faced with, with these kinds of uh, stimuli. And uh, 2014 fMRI study showed it's possible to predict whether someone is a liberal or a conservative, just by looking at their brain activity uh, when they are shown uh, threatening images. So they are more responsive to fear. And again, I want to say it makes it sound like they're all pathological, but it's important to be responsive to fear from an evolutionary perspective, or else we wouldn't be here. All of our ancestors would not have been afraid. They would have all been eaten by saber-toothed tigers. So it's important to be responsive to fear, but it's important to respond 
proportionally and not have an uh, overly fearful response. And I think one of the things is that uh, it's talked about, I've read about, is that thousands and thousands of years ago, when there were pre-civilization, I think humans had to tend to be very afraid of things because we didn't have technology and protection and we could be eaten any time. Now, although there are threats, you know, we live much longer, life is much safer relative to then, but we're wired evolutionary wise to be very fearful and to uh, see threats everywhere. And that's one of the reasons people have talked about that anxiety is so prevalent in our society today. It once may have been uh, very useful from an evolutionary purpose, but it may be exaggerated in many cases today, but it's there because it evolved from an evolutionary perspective. Kind of outlived its usefulness, but evolution doesn't change that quickly. So it's important. My point is it's good to, to some degree to have a responsiveness to fear, but when it's exaggerated and people are seeing fear uh, threats everywhere, when they're not, we have problems. And that explains a lot of the things about um, Trump supporters being fearful of immigrants, uh, let's say, because like, uh, you know, they're bringing drugs or bringing crime, Trump would say, right? Nevertheless, enormous traction. Trump was, you know, partly voted into office by fear of Mexicans bringing crime and drugs. And of course, a few of them do, somebody does, but so do a lot of uh, people born in the United States. In fact, at a higher proportion. If you really wanted to make America great, and I mentioned this in my book, you would kick out all the people born in the United States and just leave the immigrants. Those are the facts show, but he can he can exaggerate the fear of the out group and, and motivate the conservatives who will then love Trump and stick with them. So um, <clears throat> there's also another point is there's something that's similar, but not quite the same. There's something called terror management theory, and it explains why Trump's fear mongering is doubly effective. This has to do with the fact that human beings have a unique awareness of their own mortality. They know that they're going to die. They're probably the only species, well, might be others, but we don't know, but know that we're going to die. And because of that, we form culture and political ideology and religion and all kinds of things that make us feel safer, that will protect us or give some meaning or some uh, you know, protection uh, uh, because we're going to die uh, from either death or life after death or the right way to live, all these kinds of things. And humans do that. And this is all a way of managing terror, terror management theory. Um, and they'll more, also, when people are afraid, they'll more, more strongly defend their worldview because it's a matter of life and death. It's their viewpoint is the one right one, you know, uh, kill the infidels, if you will. If that's a common way right, with the 9-11 um, national or ethnic identity. It becomes essentially a survival mechanism. Your group, your belief system, your culture will protect you. And their culture, their belief system will kill you. And this is a way of managing the terror. Um, <clears throat> hundreds of studies have supported this hypothesis. Uh, so there's a lot of backing behind it. Behind it. Um, here's the thing. There are some, what I consider, quote, good Republicans. One of them is Adam Kunziger, who is a senator from Illinois. He voted to impeach Trump. And uh, he's kind of like ma making the media rounds lately, and he's getting the respect of a lot of non-Trump supporters for being brave. And he said that uh, he went on Bill Maher, and he he said on that show that he was um, thinking that Republicans should really be not stop being the party of fear and should be more about the party of hope. And they should have more faith in the United States and more faith in the future and not just support people like Trump who say, I will protect you from the dangerous other people, the dangerous Mexicans and what have you, um, and the, all the criminals. Um, and that fear should not be the motivation. And he thinks the, the, the voters will go for it, more of a hope and less of a fear theory. Uh, and uh, here's what he had to say in his own words. But I think it's even really honestly, since I've been in politics, this is my 11th year. And if you think about it, we have learned and I can only speak, you know, as a Republican looking at the Republicans is we've learned that you can get elected on a steady diet of fear. And so every fundraising email is send me five bucks to make sure that, you know, 
Nancy Pelosi doesn't destroy your family. And it's everything is this diet of fear. And eventually there's no wonder there's real damage done to democracy. So that's what my whole idea of country first is all about is A, putting the country first before the party, but B, having a little bit of optimism about the future of the greatest country in the world that knows no limits except our own imagination. So I, I admire Adam Kunziger, but I don't think he's going to be successful. I hope I'm wrong. I hope he's right. But basically because of the terror management theory um, and all the Republicans being motivated by fear, it probably won't work. His base, the base of, of, of Republicans are motivated by fear. Uh, so I wish him the best of luck, but I'm not sanguine about it. Exposure, lack of exposure to people who are different, to dissimilar others. Basically, if you are, have grown up in a place where it's a pretty homogeneous population and you don't have much exposure to other people, you tend, the, more of that is tended to be associated with Trump supporters. I think a lot of people knew this. People who do live in diverse areas and have grown up and spent time with and are uh, involved with people, diverse groups, they, are, they tend not to be Trump supporters. Um, and they looked at zip codes and they found where in certain zip codes where it's, you know, almost exclusively whites, Trump supporters, diverse zip codes, uh, liberal. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to uh, play this clip, a very brief clip of a great philosopher, King, uh, and his name is Captain James T. Kirk. He's trying here to explain to a Trump supporter that after you get to know people, were different from you, prejudices tend to disappear and, and people become less scary and it withers away. But it doesn't go well. And here he is trying to explain to a typical Trump supporter that once you get to know people, you become less afraid. It's been my experience that the prejudices people feel about each other disappear when they get to know each other. It's not in my experience. Well, he tried. What can I say? He tried. Last point of over, oh, the overview of the psychology of Trump supporters is there's a tribalism. And here's a, um, for those of you following on YouTube, a uh, screenshot of an article on Vox uh, from the journal Science. We hold on to our tribe uh, and we strongly defend those people in our tribe, meaning our group, like Republicans or Democrats. And we very as a survival mechanism we also reject very much at people outside of it and we almost consider our, our own ideology political ideology our body almost like like any people who are different or like threats to our body like a virus and uh when we are faced with people with different points of view we become very defensive and we lash out at those we think are threats to ourselves or our body if you will and you will end up like this guy you're not of the body. Peace. You're not. To you, You're friend. You're not of the body. Joy and front. Lawgivers. Peace. Lawgivers. Traitor. And that would be most unfortunate. <clears throat> now I want to turn to my own theory, which I have not seen in the psychology literature. So at least myself haven't. Um, and it's based on my training. As I said, I went to the William Allison White Institute. And that one of the founders of the William Allison White Institute was a psychiatrist named Harry Stack Sullivan, who's not as well known as he should be, but he kind of secretly informs the way a lot of psychotherapy is done. Uh, and a lot of things we take for granted today are from his uh, approaches. Um, I was talking to a colleague at, right after Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump, and I'll never forget the conversation. And this guy, a psychologist, and I, I, I was saying, you know, a lot of people are very surprised that uh, Hillary lost. And uh, <clears throat> he said, well, there are so many idiots and morons in the United States that, uh, you know, this, this, what can you expect? And, um, and I said, um, and he said, they're racists and all, you know, which you hear a lot about. And there's some truth to that, but I think it's exaggerated in the sense of, uh, I said, well, Tim, if we just look at that, them that way and call them those names. We're never going to get any of their votes. And the Democrats will continue to lose more elections by saying that these people are idiots and racists and morons. And we're not at all trying to appeal to their needs and to understand them. And he said, we're going to lose them anyway. 
uh, this this country is in, is idiotic and people in this country are crazy and that's the way it goes which to me may make them feel good but it's a recipe for losing elections and having the u.s become a more of a right-wing fascist state it's not the way to go it's just an emotional response so how do we understand it well i talked about the psychology research now my own viewpoint <clears throat> it has to do with the biggest motivator, according to Harry Stack Sullivan, and I think there's a lot of truth in this, in people, the biggest motivator is to feel good about yourself, is about self-esteem. And people, Sullivan said, will do just about anything to maintain a feeling of good self-esteem and to protect themselves from feeling badly about themselves. Anything. And that will override, sorry, it will trump anything else it will override whether it's true or not it will override whether it's mean or not it will override everything because the most important thing is that a person feels good about themselves um sometimes often it's unconscious the person doesn't say i'm going to choose something that's wrong just to feel good they will rationalize to themselves uh the viewpoint because first and foremost they're not driven by logic they're driven by uh maintaining self-esteem so um he said, Sullivan said that when there's a threat to self-esteem, a person becomes very anxious. And anxiety, he said, is the worst feeling a person can have, the dreadful anxiety. Now, person, when I say anxiety, Sullivan didn't necessarily mean trembling and shaking and having a panic attack. That he meant sometimes you're not even, you can not even be aware you're anxious. You just, it's a terrible feeling. And before you'll even feel it, you'll switch to some kind of thought or some kind of belief which will just cut it off at the past and, and prevent you from feeling anxious. It'll compensate, you'll boost your self-esteem to prevent it. Uh, it kicks in like a protective mechanism and you'll feel better. You may not even know you were anxious, but it's there um, because he said anxiety is really, is a, is, a, is a threat and a disaster to self-esteem. It's a signal that self-esteem is under attack. Um, and so my contention is that much of the support for Donald Trump can be traced back to the human being's need to protect one's self-esteem. So Sullivan very quickly talks about something called the self-system, which where ourselves tend to seek to uh, use many type of defense mechanisms to protect ourselves. Um, and there's a famous book in psychology by Greenberg and Mitchell called Object Relations and Psychoanalytic Theory. They said, based on Sullivan's theory, the self is perpetuated and protected within the personality by, and this is key, what protects the self? A complex set of rationalizations, self-deceptions, and denigrations of others, okay? Well, I think that goes on a lot with Trump supporters where they rationalize their beliefs. Um, they'll say like, oh, well, you know, he's a little bit, uh, coarse and a little bit vulgar, but, you know, um, it makes them feel better about themselves. Uh, he, and so they'll support him, for instance. They'll rationalize it. They'll deceive themselves. They'll tell themselves things that aren't true. And that not that a common thing, talking to Trump supporters? How could they believe that? It's not true. <clears throat> well, because they need to for their self-esteem. So Greenberg and Mitchell also write, each of us comes to be possessed of a self which we esteem and cherish. It, we shelter it from questioning and criticism, and we expand by commendation. And here's the important point. All without much regard to his objectively observable performances. All without much regard to his objectively observable performances, which include contradictions and gross inconsistencies. So it doesn't even matter if it's uh, not objectively true and can be demonstrated not true. You can have contradictions, gross inconsistencies. All of that is nothing compared. It's going to be overridden by the importance to protect ourselves and maintain our self-esteem. And he called all of these things security operations to keep ourselves feeling secure, uh, inside psychologically secure. And he talked about things like dissociation, and which means you know disconnecting from things uh, mentally and just not thinking about them, and something called selective inattention, which means selectively in attending, selectively not looking at certain things, which could then make us question our self-esteem, make us think we're wrong. We just won't look at it. We won't think about it. 
or we'll rationalize it away, or we just won't think about it. All of these are protective mechanisms. Okay, what does this have to do with Trump? I mentioned briefly, but I want to tie it together now. I believe, and I'm not the first person to think this, I mean, it's pretty well established and by many people that a lot of the Trump supporters are people who are losing esteem in our society. The white male working class tend to really go for Trump in high percentages. And it happens that in our society, as it's diversifying, as women are gaining in power uh, relative to men, as people of color are gaining in power relative to white men, the uh, white working class male or white working class to a lesser degree are losing their status. That does not make people feel good about themselves when you feel you are of higher status and then you're being brought down. Um, Sometimes in uh, on the left, they're t regarded, you know, as oppressors and things like that. So you've gone from like the great group to at least lesser power and sometimes the bad guy. That's lowering self-esteem. They don't like that very much. So what will what will they do? They will become anxious uh, and, and angry, anxious because their esteem's going down, and they will engage in Harry Stack Sullivan's security operations involving deceptions, rationalizations, believing things that aren't true, anything to restore their sense of self-esteem, which has been under threat. Um, the Thomas Edsall, columnist in New York Times, who I love, he wrote an article about how the whole concept of male masculinity uh, is under attack. And uh, you know they used to be regarded as the protectors and providers, and now they're losing, losing that whole status. So they're going to have to engage in these kind of Sullivanian security operations and become Trump supporters to regain a sense of power. I think it's, it applies a lot. I haven't seen much about this talked about. Um, I mean, in general, but it Sullivan had the basic theory about self-esteem. Also, a lot of the white working class are losing uh, economic status. I mean, some of them are doing still okay financially, but their jobs, uh, you know, uh, Detroit uh, cars and uh, working, you know, uh, manufacturing, it's all uh, under attack. And that way of life's uh, going away and it doesn't have the prestige it used to. Uh, union benefits and all that kind of stuff. Another loss of status. So this whole idea, I mean, tying it to Sullivan and that, which is a way we understand our, our psychologists understand our patients, our clients. That's what's new. But the basic idea of it, what I'm introducing is a new, new uh, aspect. But the basic idea that when you have a group that's been homogeneous and you begin to have uh, new people, new, new types, aliens, if you will, coming in for the first time and you think your group is going to be diluted or changed, lose status, there's a backlash, there's a counter reaction to preserve your original dominant group and keep out the outsiders and keep yourself at the top and keep your your group you know pure if you will made me think of a star trek episode from star trek enterprise which is a prequel to the original star trek it takes place before there's uh, captain kirk and spock and anyone who knows anything about star trek you know a minimum amount there's something called the federation of planets where all the different planets work together. There's all different aliens, all different groups, and there's peace between them, and it's a very progressive organization. But this uh, is a prequel, and it's about the beginning of the forming of the Federation, when all these aliens from different planets are beginning to visit Earth and are beginning to uh, mingle and interact with humans on Earth. And so people are very threatened by this, much like what I'm talking about with uh, whites in rural counties that are, are supporting Trump because they're beginning to see for the first time people of color. So I'm just gonna play some clips here. And you think about it, this is from 2005. This is from over 15 years ago. And yet it's the idea has been thought about uh, before and I think demonstrated through metaphor because science fiction is metaphor of our political issues. But see if you don't see the same theme as what I'm talking about with Trump supporters, just projected into this science fiction uh, landscape.
I want to just be clear on one thing. I'm not saying th that white males and whites should be restored to uh, their former top status. That's horrible. I'm all against that. It sh everyone should be equal, and I'm all for that. I am saying that there's a psychological mechanism behind this, and it's not going to just disappear because we don't like it. We can either understand it, and I think the approach is to speak to these people with, with a sense of respect and not to call them idiots or morons and racists because that's just going to lower their self-esteem. It's exactly, this is a big point, exactly the wrong approach if you want to get any Trump supporters, uh, people who maybe voted for Obama and then voted for Trump, people in the swing states. If you want to get those votes and, and make sure you, uh, the Democrats continue to win election and keep out populists, stop calling them morons and idiots and speak to them with respect. That doesn't mean you have to support that they should be, you know, go back to the former ways and make America great. And they should be um, the top status in society. They shouldn't, but they're going to need some understanding. Otherwise, they're going to get very anxious to engage in Sullivanian defense security mechanisms and vote for people like Trump, which is not going to help anybody. Trump does very well with people, voters who are not educated, less educated. Um, and they, they, I think this explains a lot of the feeling, the anti-elite feeling about how these Trump supporters uh, tend to hate and, and not respect elites. They don't like scientists. Um, they they uh, don't, I think uh, a lot of Republicans at Polsha don't even uh, think very highly of going to college. And they think, oh, those people, they don't know what they're talking about, those fancy coastal elites. That's a very big popular thing. Why? Well, I've never heard it talked about, but I think it has to do with this security operation stuff. Why? because they feel badly about themselves. They feel their, their respect in society is going down and all these people on the coasts with uh, uh, edu higher education are being well-regarded. So to so restore their self-esteem, they flip it around and they say, those people are idiots. We don't have to listen to them. Trump said, scientists are idiots. We have common sense. We know we don't have to listen to them. We don't have to wear masks. Um, we're the, we know what we're doing. And they'll They'll follow people on, let's say, on YouTube, YouTubers or anyone that has a conspiracy theory, and they'll say, well, that person says this, this scientist says this, so I'll just believe the guy on YouTube because they lower, they lower that uh, elite to maintain and boost their sense of self-esteem. It's terrible because it's wrong, but they have to do it because the primary motivation that overrides everything is self-esteem. I'm not stupid. They're stupid. It's very simple but very powerful. People will do anything to maintain their self-esteem if they feel threatened. Sometimes it gets really weird. Okay, I'm not saying this is Trump supporters, but I see this when I work with my clients all the time. Whatever they'll grab onto to make themselves feel good if they're not feeling good about themselves, if they're being threatened uh, with their self-esteem. So anything. So I was thinking of this scene from Ed Wood that I sh sometimes show my clients. Ed Wood is a movie starring Johnny Depp and Martin Landau um, <clears throat> about the worst film director of all time. Terrible, horrible movies, B-movies, science fiction movies. He made a movie called Plan 9 from Outer Space in, in I think it was the 50s. Anyway, here's uh, a clip from a scene where Martin Landau is playing Bella Lugosi, who played uh, Dracula. And but it's uh, in this scene, he plays a scientist who used to be very highly regarded and then loses society, loses respect for him and they doubt his findings and he's come to the laughing stock. But then to boost self-esteem, um, he comes up with this. All right, kids, let's knock them dead. My dear Professor Strauss. 20 years ago, I was banned from my homeland. I was classed as a madman, a charlatan, outlawed in the world of science, which previously honored me as a genius. Now, here in this forsaken jungle hell, I have proven that I am all right. Yes. The authorities have learned how correct your findings were. So I am here to bring you home. Home? I have no home. 
hunted, despised, living like an animal. The jungle is my home. But I shall show the world that I can be its master. I shall perfect my own race of people. A race of atomic supermen that will conquer the world. Race of Atomic Supermen to Conquer the World is a Sullivanian security operation. Now I want to talk about Canada. I want to end with, could any of this happen in Canada? And could Canada go the root of this? Well, Canadians are human beings. Sullivan's theory applies to all human beings. So the answer, first and foremost, is yes, it could happen. But I think there are a lot of reasons to, to be hopeful about Canada, uh, that it may not just take root in the same way. One of the things is there's relatively less inequality in Canada compared to the United States. There's um, less economic inequality, and there's less of a gap between the rich and the poor. It is increasing in Canada, but it has skyrocketed in the United States. And I've heard it said that if you want to live the American dream, move to Canada, because the middle class actually has more mobility in Canada, and it, it, the gap between... Um, middle class is shrinking in the United States and the gap between the rich who are getting super rich is is off the charts. Um, so I think because you have this gap, you have more people feeling insecure and loss of status in the United States. So I think uh, my logic is, is that you have less economic inequality, you'll have less of a need for security operations and all the stuff and nonsense we see in the United States. Education wise also, there's the gap is less in Canada. I have read that Canada is the most educated country in the entire world in terms of post high school education. So you have more people going on for education beyond that, less people like, um, like we see in the Trump supporters who used to have higher status, but low education, losing status, because you just see more people are educated. Still not everybody, but it's all relative to the US. Um, I think a part of this is because university, there's no pri there are no private universities in Canada. They're all state schools. Uh, the tuition is something like $4,000 a year uh, at sometimes less in Canadian universities. None of this $50,000 a year. And so a lot of people can afford to go to university. They still will complain about their high tuition rates. Um, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, everything's relative. They think it's high. I'm sure sometimes it's a hardship, but it's nothing. It's one-tenth of what it is in the U.S. So many more people can afford to get educated. Um, okay. Another, another reason why I think this is unlikely to happen in Canada, less likely, is because an important part, let me try to explain this, an important part of the Canadian identity is that they are not Americans. They are not America. There's a, 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 a not all Canadians are like this, but it's a common feeling. We are not America. We are better than America. Um, it's sort of a, a negative identity. This isn't true in the United States. I, I have never heard anyone in the U.S. say, I'm an American and uh, we could, we're not like those Canadians. I mean, I've never heard that because we're 10 times the size. But Canada sits you know, next to the U.S. It's one-tenth the population. And so everything is you know, measured in response to uh, how they fare compared to the United States. They're very proud. They're doing better in COVID. Now, there's a YouTuber who I like a lot. I learn a lot. His name is JJ McCullough. He talks, he's Canadian. He talks a lot about Canada, explains things. Um, has a very different style than me. He starts out the video saying, hello, friends, which um, I don't think I'm capable of doing. Um, I like my viewers, but I'm not going to do that. But uh, he has a lot to say. And he has this one episode where he talks about the Canadian nationalism is based on being liberal and left wing. And as the 20th century drew to a close, a very new form of nationalism had taken root in Canada. Whenever the Canadian government did anything left wing, it could be portrayed as something that was very proud and patriotic, because of course it was something that those evil right wing Americans would never do. Now, there still exists a kind of soft aftermath of British nationalism in Canada, and it still tends to mostly revolve around being proud of British-style things that Canada has and America doesn't, like a political connection to the British royal family, or the countries of the Commonwealth, or the Westminster parliamentary system, and things like that. 
And it wasn't always this way. What he's saying is it first started to identify as Canadian and have a national sense. It used to be we're, we're associated with England. We didn't break from Great Britain like the U.S. We still follow the, the crown and the queen, and we still perform many uh, part of the Commonwealth, and we still perform many British type things, and we're different than America. In fact, it was the other way where they were more right wing and they would say those Americans, they have all these different races and uh, we're more British. So things have changed completely, starting with Trudeau's father, um, Pierre Trudeau, who is the father, was the father of the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau. And uh, Canada then started becoming more liberal around that time. We have government health care. Uh, stronger gun control laws, all kinds of things that people associate with Canada. And this became a, a source of pride um, among Canadians. So we are not like those crazy right-wing Neanderthal Americans. I'm exaggerating to make the point. So, and this, it's actually, nationalism is usually considered a right-wing kind of thing, but in Canada, the nationalism is considered a left-wing. They're, they're proud of their leftist. Not all, I'm generalizing. Albertans, many Albertans don't feel this way but there's a tendency towards this. Why am I talking about this? Because I think this will help uh, protect Canada to some degree to not just follow the US politically because they're kind of very proud that they're there. They say, we're not crazy like those Americans and the Trump supporters. Part of their identity, they need to probably boost their self-esteem. I would suggest their, uh, the anti-Americanism and the sense of we're leftist, we're more progressive. It has some elements of truth. It's overstated, I think, but it has some elements of truth. But it boosts their self-esteem. It's a security operation. They'll need to hold on to it. So um, great. If that protects them from Trumpism type stuff, fine. That said, oh, and the other thing I want to say about J.J. McCullough is that no Canadian, I've been, I've been there for three years spending time there, I have never heard any Canadian say a boot for about, never, not once. Um, they, some of them say about, many of them say what sounds to me like a boat, like a ship, not a boot, like a boot, a boat, shipping, boats. Okay. And, but, and here's a clip, Americans seem, you know, the, the stereotype Americans think all Canadians say a boot. Here's a clip from South Park where Americans in the uh, UN are talking to a bunch of Canadians and they're driven into hysterics because of the way the Canadians say a boot. Fuck Canada. Hey, fuck you, buddy. Terrence and Philip will not be released. They are going to be put on trial for corrupting America's youth. We don't know what all the fuss is about. The fuss is a boat taking our citizens. It's a boot not censoring our art. It's a boot. It's a boot. What's so goddamn funny? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. Uh, could you tell us again what your argument is all about? This is not a boot diplomacy. This is a boot dignity. This is a boot respect. This is a boot realizing that humor is. <laughs> you guys are dick. Release Tant and Philip, or we'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> but they really don't. Except, except for J.J. McCullough. J.J. McCullough is the only person from Canada I have ever heard who says a boot. He also says a ruined. Of the country's leader. But today I thought we would talk about American money. Specifically, is it too boring? Americans are often a little bit insecure about their money because compared to the money of other countries, it does seem a little bland. I don't know. I, I think he might be doing this on purpose because it's, it gets people talking about him. I'm talking about him. I don't know. Another reason, uh, oh, I don't think this will catch on, and I'm going to have another podcast on the political end, Could Populism Take Root in Canada uh, from a political perspective? Um, but I'll just briefly mention, it doesn't, Canada does not border Mexico. It does not have a huge influx of uh, Mexican and other immigrants like the U.S. So it's not, in the, it's not under the same pressure to have these fear of others and gravitate towards Trump. Canada can be very selective and has been in who it lets in the country. Um, except for, I was bringing back to the beginning of the podcast, check right now where they're dropping their uh, requirements to make up for their shortage, but usually they're very selective. So they're not under the same immigration pressures of the United States, so they can afford to be more progressive. However, some people do think that it could follow, the Canada could follow the US. First of all, there you have a populist 
prime uh, premier, populist premier of the largest, most populated province in Canada, Ontario, where I live, Doug Ford, who's a populist, um, and he was voted in. And the liberal progressive was voted out. You had his uh, brother, the famous um, Rob Ford, who was a nut, populist nut, um, um, who was the mayor of Toronto. So, you know, it's not a done deal. Populism could take root there. But that would be another podcast to to talk about. Finally, I want to mention Globe and Mail had an op-ed in re- response to this drop in the immigration requirements, saying that a lot of European, old guard European, white Canadians may not like the influx of all these new immigrants, uh, people from Asia, people from all over the world. And so, you know, there is the old guard Canada used to be uh, typically white and it's changing. So I can't see how there won't be any reaction against that. But he's saying, and he's right, Canada needs immigrants. The birth rate's very low. And if Canada's going to survive economically, sociologically, it's got to have more immigrants. You have unstable times in the United States. You have the rise of populism. As I see it, democracy may not last much longer because Republicans are not voting to maintain democracy. I think in many ways they're voting to get rid of it. And should they gain power again, that might be the last election in the United States. I don't think I'm overstating this is a real possibility. 100, 140 Republicans in the Congress voted to question the legitimacy of Biden's election, the great majority of Republicans. Those are where the Trump supporters uh, are. Those are where the Republican Party now is largely the party of Trump. Over uh, 45% of the uh, Republicans in a poll supported the storming of the Capitol of the United States. The majority of Republicans think the election was fraud. There are two political parties in the United States. One of the major ones, political major ones, Republican Party, doesn't is engaging in all these Sullivan security operations. Doesn't even believe in uh, the facts and will not even agree who lost the election. Democracy may not last in the United States. It's a possibility. And the, so at the same time that's going on in the U.S., Canada right now is lowering its immigration requirements. It's easier to get into Canada, or it will be, very likely. Now's the time to think about things. Now's the time to begin to take it seriously, should you really consider applying to become Canadian and a dual citizen, which is what this podcast is all about. Think about it. And thanks so much for listening. I'd love to hear from you. What topics do you want me to discuss? What guests should I invite on the show going forward? Send me your questions and comments on social media at SShaneBart. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'll be collecting your questions and answering them during the show. Again, thanks so much for listening. See you next time.